In February 1986, this game changed the world. While I only completed it for the first time a few nights ago, I believe it remains as potent an experience as it ever did. There's a lot I have to say about this title, but if I had to describe it in one word, magnificent. So let's get the basics out of the way. The Legend of Zelda was directed by Shigeru Miyamoto and Takashi Tezuka. It was programmed by Toshihiko Nakago, Yasunari Soejima, and E. Marui. And once again, the music was done by K -K 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 Koji Kondo. Zelda 1 takes place on an overworld and an underworld. The overworld is the large map where the player is able to explore to then find access points to the underworld. The overworld has an overarching map and a map indicator on the side of the screen. It contains a variety of enemies only found in the overworld. It contains shops, secrets, and most importantly, entrances to the underworld. The underworld contains dungeons primarily. Dungeons, enemies that you only find in dungeons, bosses, items, and again, more secrets. The other component to this overworld underworld mechanic is you the player. The you of this game contains hearts, items, your position, and the subscreen. The subscreen contains a listing of all your tools and items that you've collected along the way, as well as how many pieces of the fragmented Triforce of Courage you've collected. And if you are in a dungeon and happen to have found a map, that's where you can see a more complete picture of what you'll find in that dungeon. And the last part of the basics of this game is the manual. I've seen lots of takes on Zelda 1 that it's very cryptic and it's very hard to figure out, but but the game was intended to be played with a manual. The manual comes with loads of information for the player. It can be completed without the manual, but you do have access to the manual, and the manual tells you a lot of useful things. It has complete maps of the first two dungeons. It has an overworld map that is mostly filled in for you. It even teaches you how to keep track of maps in the future before you find a map so that you don't get lost in future dungeons. It shows you things that you can do in the overworld to uncover secrets and access to the underworld. It shows burning bushes, burning trees, bombing walls, pushing rocks. A lot of this stuff is not just left to the player to discover, but it's discussed and shown in the manual. The story isn't too important in The Legend of Zelda, but essentially Hyrule is under siege. Ganon has completely corrupted the entire world. Princess Zelda is held hostage in the underworld, but she sends her handmaiden Impa out to go find someone to help. And that someone is you, Link. So that's really the basics of the game. There's the overworld, the underworld, you and the manual. And it's up to you to navigate this world that's been laid out before you to conquer each of the eight dungeons before Death Mountain in order to restore the Triforce and then to defeat the Prince of Darkness Ganon and save Hyrule. So this isn't my first Zelda game and it's not my very first time playing this game. The first time I ever saw Zelda 1 was at my friend Jacob's house when I was a kid. This was in the 90s. I was born in 92 and this was probably like 98 or 99. He had an NES because he had an older older brother and I remember that he put this cartridge in and started playing it and even then the game just had this archaic look to it to me. I remember the first thing I thought when I saw the game was this game looks old and that was in the 90s still. And, you know, I had also seen this same friend play bits and pieces of Ocarina of Time, but I never had access to a Zelda game of my own. And it wasn't until 2010 that I played my first Zelda game. And my first Zelda game was Spirit Trap. 
tracks for the DS. A lot of people might even count that as the worst Zelda game. Hopefully at some point I can talk about that in the future, but Spirit Tracks was my entry point into the Zelda series. I loved Spirit Tracks. If you're having trouble imagining that, just imagine you've never played any other Zelda and that's your first Zelda. And so after that, I played Skyward Sword and Ocarina of Time 3D. And when I had my 3DS, that's when I was given access to some of these older NES titles, including the first Legend of Zelda. So that's when I first tried it, was I think 2011, maybe 2012. I remember it's just, I wanted to play it because I had become a fan of the series. I was looking into games like Wind Waker, I was looking into games like Majora's Mask, I wanted to play more games in the franchise because I had enjoyed Skyward Sword and I had enjoyed Spirit Tracks. But this game felt different. It felt stiff, almost archaic. There was no direction because I didn't have access to the manual. I just had downloaded the game. And I also entered the wrong dungeon because in this game, you can enter dungeons whenever you find them. You don't have to do things in a specific order, which is not what I was used to from the other games in the franchise. I ended up trying again a few years later and it was kind of the same story. I did make it a little farther and it's funny because just checking back on my old save file I found that I had 22 deaths and I think I had beaten the first dungeon and then was struggling with three. I couldn't find dungeon two. So I've always wanted to go back and experience this game and for the first time I feel like I was able to do that. My experience with this game this time was just completely different. Everything was different this time around. What I found is that the Legend of Zelda, the original, is a deep, profound, and hauntingly good experience. I found a world of mystery and intrigue, brilliantly designed with rewarding exploration. It's unlike any of the other early titles that I had played or that I have played on the NES so far. There's this consistent design language that permeates the overworld and the underworld. You start to understand the game and it becomes easier to find these sort of secrets that are just not out in the open but then you just you can look at things and start to think like you know there's probably a bomb of a wall here or like this bush looks odd it's odd how there's not a fairy in this fountain things of that nature you start to put the pieces together i found freedom like in a way that i haven't seen in a lot of these games and in a way that i don't see in a lot of games today there is also a terrific challenge to zelda one it is a hard game but it's by no means impossible and it's very immersive. Not at first. You have to allow yourself time to get into it, but it becomes this really immersive experience. Another thing is that The Legend of Zelda, and this is like kind of like by running into a wall several times before playing it this time, it's like an actualization of the concept knowledge is power. This time I was able to do things a little differently. I knew a few of the locations from previous failures. I was able to get the white sword right away, which is an upgrade over the wooden sword that you start with. I also knew of the blue ring and kind of the general area it was located in. I didn't get it until like after dungeon three or four or so, but I knew it was coming. The game also has this feeling of growing stronger and that's tightly coupled with progression in the game. And then then upon like getting further in the game, I realized that this game actually shares more DNA with some of my other favorite games than I realized. This game feels like it shares more and has more in common with games like Dark Souls and Demon Souls than it does with later games in its own series. Like Link to the Past through Skyward Sword, there's this consistent formula and it's a formula that I came to love and it's the formula that introduced me to the franchise but this game is different and it's also cool because having playing games like Binding of Isaac I always knew it was inspired by Zelda 1 but I didn't know just how inspired it was. <laughs> But this game blew me away. It feels like I was finally ready to experience it. And that begs the question, why wasn't I ready to experience this before? Luckily, I can help illustrate this for you and hopefully allow it 
allow you to have an easier time playing this game and getting to experience just how good it really is. Really, in a nutshell, you just need a comfortable way to experience this game. And this also ties into older games in general, but if you're looking to play this game, here's a few quick tips before I move on. You need to get as close to zero input delay as possible. This goes with any older game, it especially goes with this one. It's kind of tight, you're moving on a grid, you know? You need low input lag. The game is going to feel so much different and so much better. The first time I played this game, it just wasn't right. You know, the tiny 3DS screen kind of running on this virtual console emulator, it just didn't feel close to as tight as it does on actual hardware. So really another thing is the controller. You need a controller option that's not a compromise. For example, the Nintendo Switch Online app has this game, but I'm not sure I would recommend playing it on that and unless you have a controller with a proper D-pad, and that does not count Nintendo's Pro Controller, and it doesn't count the D the uh, the Joy-Con. You really would need something like one of those 8-bit Do Minis, or like one of the bigger ones, something with a proper D-pad. I think Hori also has controllers like this. You also need as close as you can get to original hardware. Not everyone can be playing this game on original hardware, but get close to it. You don't want to be running a wonky emulator that like, like, does a whole bunch of different things. You don't want to be playing on like, you know, just try and find something that you know is good. And then lastly, it's your mindset. With a lot of these games, unless you're playing on like a physical cartridge, um, you're usually playing it within an environment where you have access to hundreds of games, maybe thousands of games. And so you can just pop in and pop out. And when it's so easy to switch between games, you'll also know this if you're a Steam user, you find you're not gonna make a lot of progress. You have to play it with the intent and the mindset that this is something you're gonna sit down and beat because otherwise you're really not gonna experience Zelda 1, even by playing it. You have to kind of have that mindset that it's something you wanna beat. So back to talking about the game itself. It's not a puzzle game. Zelda kind of is thought of as being like a franchise where you're kind of solving these puzzles, pushing blocks. You push blocks in this game, but only one position ever. And it's just like when it's the most obvious thing in the room. It's not really a puzzle game. It's more of a survival game. You're fighting enemies. It's, it's, it's a lot like Dark Souls, again. There's also this thing in this game that I feel like I haven't seen in other games where when you're nearing a boss door, like when you're nearing a boss to fight a boss, you can hear it like screeching and screaming. From like a few doors away and it's just like builds it. It's like you're in this room and it's like, just like, it's it's so, why isn't that done? I feel like even in Dark Souls, you're not experiencing that. Like you see the fog door, but you're not like hearing the boss. You're not hearing like this thing, like this, you don't know what it is. It's just this thing that you have to fight and you can hear it screaming from like doors, like complete rooms down in a labyrinth. It's extremely cool and atmospheric for a 1986 title. And like, um, getting the white sword first made this game feel a lot better right from the get-go. I was struggling even in the first dungeon, my first few times playing this game. And uh, it's so cool too, just on an aside, the entrance to the first dungeon, just like the dead trees, the tree opening, everything about this game just has this really cool look and feel to it once you are in the world, like once you're in it. But when I was in the dungeons, I wanted to discover everything. I realized that without looking it up, I wasn't gonna be able to find every secret in the overworld unless I really wanted to sit down. But you don't have to. I found a a lot, a lot that I had remembered and um, I had to look up a few things over the course of this playthrough. But for the most part, I tried to keep it as close to home as I could, um, save for really, really using the, um, the manual and this adorable map that they give you. Just like fantastic stuff. Even And on the back, I'm looking right here, level one, level two, like completely explained. I was playing on the Famicom version, so the manual wasn't super helpful, um, but I the PDFs are on Nintendo's website. If you're playing this game, there's really no excuse to not gain access to these things. Like the magical shield, that's another thing. The Zoras in the ocean and in the lakes are super annoying. Their projectiles are really fast. Anything that travels at a diagonal in this game is 
is like tough to deal with, but you also gain access to that and the ability to use diagonals with the boomerang. So it kind of evens out. It's also like really interesting to me how this game, when you restart or like when you save it and come back to it, you don't start it with full hearts. You just start it with three every time. And so very interesting that like whenever you're starting a game, the first thing you're usually doing is going to the fairy fountain in the Eastern forest and you replenish your hearts. It's just kind of another step, like another indicator that like the more you learn, the easier this game will become for you. The more you pay attention to your surroundings, the more you think, but not in a puzzle sense, just like in a survival sense. So the items in this game are very cool and varied and kind of impressive for what I was expecting. I was like, I knew about bombs. I wasn't expecting all the craziness with the boomerang. Biggest letdown though is probably the bow. The bow and arrow, it's just kind of like, I didn't want to spend money because you have to spend money to shoot arrows, which kind of makes sense. You know, it's expensive, but the boomerangs are really cool. They stun enemies and they can also grab things for you from across the map. And just the fact that you can shoot them off at diagonals is a huge advantage in combat. It can also, once you get the magical boomerang, it can one hit kill like smaller enemies like the little tiny slime boys and the bats or the keys as they're called. The bow and arrow, you also gain access to the bow in the first dungeon along with the boomerang. And it's kind of like, um, it's like, it was like a more of a last resort for me. You can play this game however you want and you can use whatever items you prefer. But for me, it was more about like, I didn't mind getting up close and personal with the sword, especially once I got the white sword, which looks more like a real sword. There is water of life, two different kinds, a red kind and a blue kind. The red kind you can use twice, the blue kind you can use once. And what it does is it restores all of your hearts, um, but you have to physically use it. It doesn't activate automatically like a fairy does in other games. But this is pretty much required, at least for me, or if you would like to keep your death count lower for doing the more difficult later dungeons. It's expensive, but it's worth it. And it's also something that you can use in the middle of combat. You just access your sub screen, you swap to it, and then as soon as you exit, you mash the B button, you mash your item button, and you're able to watch slowly as your hearts completely restore. And it's kind of satisfying, honestly. It's more satisfying than stuffing your face with food in an Elder Scrolls game, that's for sure. Bombs are really strong. It's kind of satisfying to see bombs be strong. Like, obviously bombs should be strong, but then you look at like firebombs and stuff in Dark Souls, and it's super weak and like not even worth your time. But in this game, bombs are strong. They help you take out like entire bosses and it's it can help make rooms full of dark nuts Which is one of the harder enemies in the game a little more bearable You have rings that change the color of your cloak There's two different rings in the game a red ring which you get in the final dungeon And unless you plan on leaving that dungeon and exploring more afterward You're not gonna really get a whole lot of use out of it But then the blue ring is very expensive. It costs 250 rubies. You heard me right rubies not rupees as in as they are in later Zelda games um, at least according to the manual but the rings make you take less damage it's essentially like an armor upgrade you can find the power bracelet in the overworld and that allows you to push blocks that eventually lead to shortcuts where you can like cut through to different areas of the world really fast which is really cool <laughs> Items that you can pick up off of enemies are like the bombs you can pick up, rubies you can pick up, and uh, this clock looking item. And picking that up kind of functions, again, we keep going back to the star and Mario, but it functions kind of like that, but a little bit different. It, it freezes all other enemies on the screen. And it is a godsend in dungeons where you're surrounded by harder enemies or dangerous ones like leg likes. And speaking of leg likes, um, this is the only enemy in the game that can really take away something from you, like take away an item from you. They can take away your magic shield, which can cost 160 rupees, or sorry, rubies, or like 90 if you know the right place to buy it. Which again, there's so much crazy stuff in this game. Like the different shops, you, you have to know where to go. It's like you can get a better deal on the other side of the map than you can on this side of the map. But do I really want to go all the way over there? I'm only 10 rupees away. Like there's decisions to be made in this game. You've got candles, two different kinds, a red candle and a blue candle. And the candles are good for burning bushes or trees outside to potentially unco uncover secrets. And they also light up rooms because when you're down in the underworld, not everything's lit up. It can be hard to see. And so you have to use fire to light up the room. The blue candle is actually what you get first. 
and you can just buy that from a shop. But you can only use it once while you're on a screen, and if you wanna use it on that screen again, you're gonna to have to leave to a different screen and then come back and reuse it. Whereas the red one, you can just keep blasting. Or maybe it's only twice? Whatever. There's also a magic rod that functions kind of like, and I can't believe I haven't mentioned this yet, but when you're at full health and you thrust your sword, you fire out a beam from your sword. So it allows you like a little bit of distance because when you're up close, it's kind of stubby and like, it's kind of hard to hit enemies sometimes, especially the dark nuts, which you can only hit from the sides and the back. So it just serves as a way to be safe. But again, you, if you're touched one time, you lose access. But later, when you gain access to the magic rod, while it may not do as much damage as your sword beams do always, um, it just like gives you that option to just kind of like deal with foes from a distance without having to waste arrows. And then even later, when you get the magic book, which is basically the Bible, whenever your magic rod beams make contact with walls or other things of that nature, um, they will combust. And so it kind of, for the purpose of lighting up rooms, it makes the flames useless, but the flames are still, the candles are still useful for burning like specific spots, which you need to access certain secrets. There's also bait, which is an extremely expensive item in the game that I didn't use that draws other enemies to it, but it is required to progress at a certain part in this game. So you do have to buy bait at some point. And it just looks like meat on the bone, basically. And then lastly, there's the whistle or the flute. And this actually allows you a method of fast travel fast traveling to different dungeons. Supposedly you can face the direction of a dungeon and go to it, but I didn't have too much success with that method. It, it seemed just kind of random sometimes, but it still helps you if you have a general idea of where you want to go. And it only warps you to dungeons that you have already beaten. So that combined with the power bracelet really gives you a lot of options for traversal in this game. The game is also loaded with enemies, like a huge variety of enemies. It's not like in Mario where you've just got Goombas, Koopas, Hammer Bros, Fireballs in the first Mario, Bowser. That's a boss though. Lakitu. Oh, and the Spiky Boys and the, the Black Shell Boys. Okay, there are more enemies in Mario, but there are far more enemies in Zelda. And it's cool that there's a difference. There's the overworld enemies and there's like different tiers of difficulty there. And then there's the underworld enemies, which can be just as easy as some of the overworld enemies, even easier sometimes, or just like painfully difficult. My favorite enemies in the overworld were the Lionels. And if you've played Breath of the Wild, you'll know it's like the lion, horse, centaur hybrid guys. And what I love about these guys is they act as a natural barrier in the overworld. You're allowed to progress and go anywhere you want in the overworld, but the Lionels are there to kind of prevent you from moving forward easily and to give you an indicator that you might not be strong enough for a dungeon you may find in this general area. It might be best to turn around and try something else. The ghosts, which are known as Poe in later games, are called Ginnies or G-H-I-N-I's here. And um, they're kind of boring. They're found in the graveyard, but the um, the thing that they're really good for is farming for items, hearts, and rupees. Octoroks, Tech Tykes, Zora, Moblins, Leavers, those aren't really worth getting into. The pea hats though, if you've played Ocarina of Time, that thing that like pops out of the ground, it starts spinning around like crazy right as you walk out into Hyrule Field, that is a pea hat and they are in this game and they are kind of annoying because you have to wait for them to land to hit you and most other enemies you can just attack. And then there's the Armos, which are supposedly these frozen knights. It's it's the guys where if you bump into them in the overworld, they come alive and come to life. Sometimes there are secrets hidden under them. And so you definitely want to hit all of them to see where they are. Some of them move extremely fast. Some of them move more manageably, but um, they're a cool looking enemy. And to me, they look almost like a robot kind of night, but if you look at the concept art, that's not really the case. And the underworld just also has such a large variety, a larger variety of enemies that you can find. They have bosses, which is kind of like its own separate category. And then you've got like the regular enemies. So like um, wall masters are in most Zelda games, it's those hands that can grab you and pick you up and put you back into a regular part of the dungeon. In fact, there's, there's a room early on in one of these dungeons that has a whole bunch of wall masters and it looks like a dead end. And it just speaks to the design of this game because like when you're confronted with these sort of dead end rooms and like there's a lot of enemies in them though, it's like, huh, something's not right. And so it's it's like, it's always worth it to kill everything in a room and then start pushing these blocks because 
a lot of the time it opens up a secret stairway or a pathway that leads down to like an item that you might have missed. The Stalfos or Skeleton guys though, they are chumps in this game. They're extremely easy. Um, in other games, I feel like sometimes they wait until they give you a Stalfos. And this one, it's just like, these boys are chumps. Gibdos are another like recurring enemy in this in this franchise. Um, they're the mummy guys. I think supposedly they can lock onto you in this game. That did not happen to me in this playthrough. I guess I'm just too good at this game. The whiz robes are probably one of the hardest enemies. A lot of their attacks, like a lot of your attacks can be like, they're just unaffected by and they can warp around you and they can go through obstacles and they fire beams at you. They're very difficult. There's also two tiers to a lot of these enemies. There's like the easy version and the hard version. Usually the easier one has more of an orangey red theme and then the harder enemies will be blue. But the blue enemies also have higher rates, it appears to me, of like dropping bombs or dropping rupees. Goraya are these enemies that throw boomerangs at you and there's also two tiers of those. There are zoles and gels, which are just like little tiny slimes that move around the floor. They're kind of just there, I guess, to kind of make you feel good about yourself because they're really easy to defeat. The snakes are called ropes and they are actually a little tricky because they can go extremely fast as soon as they see you. And it's funny because like playing this game, I'm seeing where pretty much every enemy in Binding of Isaac was directly copied and pasted from this game. One of the cooler enemies to me was the Vire. Um, there are these like little demon looking gargoyle guys. And if you kill them, they split into two bats. They, they would often drop like exactly what I needed at exactly the right time in dungeons. And so like I came to like them more because they were giving me what I needed to progress. There are these cat looking enemies that I think if you have the, if the Famicom controller with the microphone, you can yell and that weakens them. But they're surprisingly difficult because they just kind of hop around and they look cute see but they're only found in the later dungeons and they're actually one of the harder enemies in the game there's two different types of like snake looking enemies that move around and um, both of them are easily defeated with the magic rod um, there are blue ones which are more like centipedes and then the red ones which are more like worms land mola and moldorns respectfully the like likes as i've already said uh can eat your shields and they're one of the hardest they're like slow moving but they're very intimidating and you'll often find this other enemy called a bubble in the same rooms as them and what happens is the bubble will hit you and disable your ability to use your sword for a little bit. And so you'll just kind of be stuck and you'll not know what to do. And that's when your magic shield gets eaten. And then only in the last dungeon of the game, Death Mountain, you can find this extremely cool enemy called a Patra. And it's like this head with this, like these flying things around it. And they go in these bizarrely cool patterns that just kind of like, it's like, what is happening in this game? And like, as I've said, the dungeons can be done in any order, but I would recommend recommend doing them in order. For example, I stumbled upon an odd looking tree and I burned it and I went inside and it was level eight. And when that happened, I decided to leave. And it was the right call because had I progressed, I might have died because in two of the entrance doors, the boss of level three, which I had died to in my old playthroughs, was lurking behind both of them as just a mini boss, just a regular enemy practically in those dungeons. The later ones are, are insane, but you've got the eagle, the moon, the manji, which isn't what you think it is. It's just like a symbol that kind of indicates on maps, sometimes temples or something in Japanese maps. It's not what it looks like. You've got level four, the snake, level five, lizard, level six, dragon, level seven, demon, level eight, lion, and then finally level nine, death mountain. It's just such a beefy game. And these, these dungeons take time to navigate. And like, there are probably more screens to the dungeons significantly, maybe even twice as many as the overworld. It's crazy. The size of the last dungeon alone is just bizarre. But the eagle is where you fight Aquamantis, which is a dragon that looks very cool fantastic first boss he's not too difficult and um he looks cool again you hear the screaming from a few screens away you also get the bow and the boomerang so like you pretty much like you're really gonna want to have access to those items in future dungeons the moon has dodongo which i had trouble getting the bombs right inside him but then i figured out that if it goes off close enough to him you can just finish him off with your sword also the magical boomerang is tucked away if you beat all of the enemies in one of the rooms level three the manji dungeon has manhandla and that enemy certainly manhandled me the first 
time I played this game, but not this time. I would just say drop a bomb on that guy and you'll get two or maybe three of his heads. And after that, you just have to get lucky and hit him because he moves around super fast. You also get the step ladder in that le in that level, which um, allows you to access like upwards. So the step ladder, I think, is what lets you get to, or is it the raft? Whatever you get in dungeon three is what gives you access to access dungeon four, which I guess like I should mention a few things about the overworld. There are four dungeons that are just kind of out in the open, and that would be one, two, three, and six. Then there are four that are a little more well disguised and hidden, being four, five, eight, and nine. And then the hardest to find is dungeon seven, but I have watched videos about this game, and a lot of people just love showing off that if you blow the whistle in that area, it drains away. And so that one I did kind of have prior knowledge to, but had I not, it, you know, who's to say? Who's to say I would have found it? But like dungeon six is where the difficulty really picks up. The whiz robes are just insanely difficult and like uh, the like likes and the um, the bubbles going around. And so like you just like I died, I think the first time in dungeon six, I died four times in this game in this playthrough. Um, the first time I had reset my game and then realized that I hadn't saved and I had gotten another magic shield. And so it was just like, man, but the other times I just rolled with it and I ended up with three on my counter, but it was four total deaths. But at, after level six though, like you're starting to see more mini bosses in these dungeons. You're starting to see like um, an increase in just the number of enemies. And it's like almost all the harder types. Like in dungeon eight, there's a room full of dark nuts and there's four statues and they're all firing beams at you while you're trying to dodge them, while you're trying not to die. It's kind of thrilling to be honest. And then dungeon, dungeon eight might be my favorite dungeon in the game. You get to fight the four headed Gleok, which is the Gleoks are the coolest enemies like the coolest bosses probably it's just like these big multi-headed dragons and when you knock off one of their heads the head flies around and still is trying to get you but then death mountain is just in a league of its own it is such a brilliant dungeon and it just like it goes to show it's like a testament of the design of this game just how good it is so if you're doing as i did and just trying your best to find every secret in dungeon eight you have a chance to discover something called the magical key and that allows you to unlock every key in the game i've heard complaints that there are a lot of keys in dungeon 8 but i always had a surplus of keys um going into most of these things i was not a stranger to bombing walls as soon as i found the maps in these dungeons like if it looked like i could bomb it i would test it and i would say don't worry about your bombs because the first few times i tried playing this game i was always concerned about wasting bombs but you're not gonna waste them don't worry about it use the bombs you're gonna get more it's easy to get more bombs but death mountain there's this there's this part where i just had this realization of like how genius this game is sometimes. There's this part where you come across a dead end and probably if you're facing me, the top right portion of Death Mountain and you come in and you see there's just this room and there's these two brick, like impassable brick pathways that, that kind of point towards it. It almost looks like a hallway. There's nothing on either side. And I remember coming up across that and I was just like, I bet if I access the top part of this and I bomb it, I'm gonna be able to bomb the bottom part and get to a secret and sure enough, it was there. It's like, that's a really solid design um, that you, you just pick up on things. And um, also just the last moments of this game, like when you're when you're about to finally fight Ganon and um, you beat him, and then there's just this full Triforce there waiting for you to pick up and like this pile of dust or guts or whatever it is below it. It feels very special and it feels like something that... Hmm. It feels as good as any moment in modern gaming that I've had within the past five years. It feels as satisfying or more potentially. Like it feels good beating this game. You feel like you've actually accomplished something. You're not just going through the motions. You actually did something. So final thoughts on The Legend of Zelda for Famicom and NES. This game is required reading 
for anyone who has more than a cursory interest in gaming as a hobby, or gaming historically, or gaming competitively. If you enjoy video games, there is something in your favorite game that was borrowed from this game. An absolute trailblazer of a game. Like, it's, I don't know, I when I beat this game, like, it's like, I, I don't know how many times in a year I even feel this strongly about a game. It was really special, and I 100% recommend playing this. The Legend of Zelda is pretty rad. Thanks for watching. Thank you.